pour la comédie, c'est un grand plaisir, un grand honneur d'être ici, à chez vous. But I'm going to speak in English and on, I'm afraid. Um, I want to say that this is really one of the greatest honors and one of the greatest pleasures of my life to have been invited to give these lectures. Just by way of background, in 19, I think it was 1971, um, I was teaching in Ireland. Jobs were a plenty in those days, you know, it's an unusual world. And, uh, but I wanted to leave for a number of years because I wanted to do some study abroad and so on. I had my doctorate in Ireland and I'd just begun in a teaching post. And um, I, I think I sent off 60 PDA, you know, postdoctoral fellowship applications. But I wrote to one person in particular and I said, my great wish would be to study with you if it's possible. And that was Charles Taylor. Um, you were here at the time in, in Montreal. You wrote a very nice letter back, I'm sure you remember. <laughs> Explaining that unfortunately you didn't command resources to be able to just give out postdoctoral fellowships, but I uh, wish me the best, and that I was very fortunate to be able to uh, then spend time in England, and during, we overlapped in England for a number of years, and I had the great pleasure of getting to know uh, Charles Taylor, as well as uh, having already come to appreciate his work. So. It's really, uh, I can't say how great a pleasure and honor it is to speak, to give this first of the inaugural Charles Taylor lectures. I'm sure it will continue for very long into the future, long after we're, we're all gone. The Charles Taylor lectures will remain as a memento of this wonderful man and this great, uh, great citizen of Montreal and of, of Canada. So I'm going to talk on what I describe here, I think, as Taylorian themes. Um, of which certainly persons and the values are two. Um, it is a series of political philosophy, I'm conscious of that. But like Chuck, if I may refer to him as that, like Chuck himself, um, um, they're in the, as what well, precincts of political philosophy, to use a Hobbesian phrase, um, both the issue of um, the nature of persons and values are crucial to thinking about political philosophy. And, Indeed, a lot of his work, and a lot of his work that's influenced me in particular, is in that area of looking at the foundations. I mean, there are topics that got, I think, overlooked in, for many, some period in, in the theory of justice, but for example, Rawls returns to them at the beginning of Justice as Fairness, a restatement, you know, as he gets back to, we've got to think about what a person is, we've got to think about what values are. Anyhow, those are the topics I've chosen, and I... Uh, I hope that they meet with the approval of, of the person in whose honor these lectures are given. Okay, so on persons, um, let me just say, there are many different accounts of what a person is. It's really interesting, and they're totally sort of at loggerheads in the sense that they emphasize quite different themes. So one approach to what is a person is the approach, for example, you find originally in Boethius. You know, Boethius is right through the Middle Ages down to uh, down to the early modern period, Boethius is cited all the time on what is a person, and the answer is an individual substance of rational nature, or ratiocinative nature, I would say, the word in Latin is rationalis. Um, and the idea is that what a person is, it's a, an agent who's different from, let's say, a dog or a cow, or assuming, as I certainly do, that these are biological agents, uh, in being rationalist, capable of reasoning. And that's a, I think of that as a capacity appro uh, centered approach to what being a person is. You identify a capacity that's distinctive of personhood. I mean, an essay by Dan Dennett, which I quite like um, in one of his collections, exemplifies this as he lists all the capacities. They, they bundle really around the capacity to interpret other persons as the crucial thing, as well as being able to reason with them. And indeed, Chuck himself in, um, has a, at least some, some element of this um, <coughs> capacity-centered approach when he talks about a person as being essentially a respondent, having a capacity to respond to other agents in a distinctive way. That's one approach. But a second approach to what is a person is, I describe it here, you all have a handout, I think, as a duty-based approach. And a good example of that is Locke, when he says, person is essentially, person is a forensic concept. Um, 
So a person, the idea is, is the sort of agent that you can hold responsible, as in forensics, can hold responsible for past deeds, hold answerable for what they did in the past, and require them to account for themselves and what they did in the past. You know, and that you can't do, obviously, with a non-human animal, or at least any of the non-human animals we are familiar with. That's a, a duty base, so the, uh, the duty, so to speak, to, to respond to the challenge, our responsibility-based conception. But another is a rights-based conception, and Rawls is really the best example of that when he talks about persons in the theory of justice as self-authenticating sources of moral claims. In other words, a person is, on this account, by definition, is an agent who has claims on other agents as rights that he or she can assert against other agents. So that's a, a rights-based versus duty-based or capacity-based. But apart from that, there are, for example, think of Harry Frankfurt. You know, to be a person is not just to have desires and act on the desires of the beliefs. It's to have desires about what desires you'd want yourself to act on. And to be a person is to be the sort of agent who can live up to those higher order desires or volitions, as he calls them. Uh, so this is a sort of uh, ideal center picture of a person. A person is an agent with a, a built-in ideal, in his phrase, of living up to the higher order desires as to what at a lower order you desire. I mean, a version of that too, of course, is the Kantian approach, which Christine Korsgaard has given a lot of uh, emphasis to in recent years, where for her, again, a person, and for Kant, a person is an agent who can respond to reasons, you know, recognize what reasons are and respond to them. And uh, on this picture, you can fail to be, so to speak, a full person. You can fail to live up to that ideal. In, uh, for example, Frankfurt's uh, terminology, you cease to be a person if you don't aspire to that ideal or live up to it in any measure. You become what he calls a wanton. Um, sort of, it's a horrible mixture of saying person wanton. You want to pronounce it like person wanton, but if you don't say wanton, I guess, with that pronunciation in English. However, the, again, the idea is a wanton is a human agent who just doesn't live up to that ideal and is therefore not a person, hence an ideal-based conception. There's also a value-based conception, and, and uh, uh, Charles Taylor himself is associated with this, for example, as he's often uh, emphasized in various writings I cite here, I think it's some phrases from him, that um, for a person, things matter in an original way, and he goes on explaining in that passage that a person is the sort of agent who can feel shame or pride or guilt. Again, linking, um, linking personhood with, in this case, a sense of values. Now, I'll be talking specifically about values tomorrow. I'm trying to connect with some of uh, his work on that very theme. I'm going to not emphasize that particularly today, except to focus on the pride, shame, and, and love, as he says here. Now, if we want a, an account of personhood, it seems to me a natural aspiration would be to have an account that makes sense of why people would have emphasized these five things, you know, capacities, duties, rights, an ideal, values, to have a conception of person, the person, persons, that made sense of why they should all be, as it were, probes on what a person is. They should all be, as they all are, relatively intuitive, uh, appealing uh, remarks, glosses, on what it is to be a person. If we could explain that, then you'd feel uh, you'd be getting somewhere, you know, getting towards a theory of personhood that, that encompass these different, uh, these different aspects. Ideal, I should say, also, we are used to the idea that of a legal person, that groups can also count as persons. Very interesting idea, I believe myself. It would be nice, though it would not be presumably a basic desideratum, that you might also be able to explain the basis on which groups, or certain sorts of groups, corporate groups, could ever have been thought to be legal persons in that sense. So those are all now desiderata on a theory of personhood. And I'm going to try to sketch a view of persons that um, I think 
answers to those desiderata quite well. I actually think of the view that, I, uh, that I'm going to put forward, I'll describe it here as a language first view of personhood, as in language is really to the fore. And by the way, by language now, I mean it very inclusively, so language need not be, uh, it could be sign language, for example, it, it's any medium of communication of the specifically human sort, and there are many accounts of what makes human <coughs> communication special. And uh, that's the broad sense in which I mean it. Now, I'm going to defend a language first theory of personhood, which really rings bells, I hope, uh, with the work of, uh, of Charles Taylor. But now, this is to strike a very non-Charles Taylor note, if I say. I also think it's, a, it's an approach that is deeply based, rooted in the work of Thomas Hobbes. I say this is a uh, very un-Taylorian, as it were, to be pro-Hobbesian. Um, I don't know where this comes from. I feel that, I mean, I don't like Hobbes' politics, of course, who does? But I think that there's a lot in Hobbes' philosophical psychology. And I feel that it may be a Canadian thing. It may go back to C.B. Macpherson, you know, and Hobbes is a horrible sort of rank individualist, possessive individualist, and so on. Uh, in any case, the one, if I have one sort of strand of mild complaint about, uh, uh, about Charles Taylor's work, it's that Hobbes gets short shrift, you know, in, in many places where I would have given him longer shrift or whatever, <laughs> than whatever appropriate it is. Okay, so in order to introduce this notion of precedent, let me just take you back to a concept that Hobbes made central in his thinking. And it's a concept, actually, the word, at any rate, we now know he picked up from some of his lectures we think he had attended in Oxford in the, uh, in the 1590s. And that's someone called John Case, um, who's an Aristotelian scholar, but did introduce this word. And it figures in Hobbes quite centrally. And the word is, it also figures, incidentally, in Shakespeare. Uh, the word is personate. Uh, it's a sort of I think of impersonate is, so to speak, to pretend you're another person, right? To personate is to present yourself as a person. Now, what does he mean? That's not very uh, illuminating just to say that. He describes personation, Hobbes. Most of this is in chapter 16 of Leviathan, for those who are interested, but it's very condensed there. And what I'm going to offer, I describe as a Taylor-based, Hobbes-based view of personhood, but I'm not going to pay attention to the detail of either of their views, so uh, I shouldn't blame either of them for any error in, uh, in the account I'm going to offer. So I am going to take over the notion of personation from Hobbes, and what is it to personate? Well, personation for Hobbes is, first of all, an activity, and you've got the capacity to personate, and what is a person? A person for him is just an agent, it is an agent, and that of course introduces some constraints in itself. A person is an agent who has the capacity to personate. Now we all know there's lots of jokes about the word capacity, you know, as in, can you play the piano, someone asks me, and I reply, well, I don't know, I've never tried. <laughs> and, you know, we all think of that as a joke because the sense of capacity that was at issue when I was asked, do I play the piano, was not that abstract sense, or remote sense of capacity, as the medievals would have called it, but a more proximate sense. It's a, a sort of exercise-dependent sense of capacity. You have to actually play the piano with some uh, degree of, of success in order to claim or be said to have the capacity to play the piano. Now, personation, as I read Hobbes, at least as I developed this sort of view, to me a person is to have that exercise-based capacity to personate. But of course I haven't yet told you anything uh, about what it is to, to personate. Hobbes himself says, he uses words like, to personate is to be the author of your words, uh, to own the words as yours. But all of this remains just a little bit obscure. So let me try to give you an account of how. I think of personation and why we can have a personation-based theory of what personhood is. If we just look at this activity and this capacity closely enough, 
And then I'm going to suggest that if um, persons are understood as agents with the capacity in that sense to personate, we can actually make sense of those five desiderata. We can make sense of five persons are thought of special capacities, to have duties, to have rights, to be answerable to a certain ideal, to connect with values in an important way. Okay, so what is it to personate? Well, the word, as Hobbes actually himself explains, comes from the Latin, persona, and comes from the Latin personare, per meaning through and sonare to sound or to speak out, <coughs> and the word persona in classical Latin meant a mask, because someone on stage presenting a play carried a mask before them, which basically said, I am Zeus, you know, or Jupiter as it might have been in, in Roman times, and, uh, and spoke through the mask. The mask identified to the audience who it was, what character it was, was being portrayed. And you spoke through, uh, through the mask, personare, and the persona just simply meant the mask, or the character that you were, so to speak, representing, that you were presenting, in fact. And what Hobbes suggests, and this is what I want to build on, is that to personate is to hold out a character to which you, you, which you claim is, this is who I am. It's to hold out, although we would say, a persona. It's to reject a persona to other people, inviting them to treat you as someone who has that persona. A persona, in this case, will refer to, obviously, a range of beliefs a range of desires, a range of emotions, a range of dispositions, a range of values. Persona is the character that's associated with you. And to personate is to present a character of that kind. The idea is a person at one level is someone who interprets themselves to, or themselves, to other people. Uh, interprets as in, in words, usually, but not always, but in words, presents to other people the persona that they invite other people to take them to realize. But now, how do they do that? Well, personating is obviously a form of communicating. I personate when I communicate to you what my beliefs, my values, my desires, my emotions, etc., my dispositions are. That's what it is, but it's a special sort of communication. And it's this also, I think, in both Taylor and Hobbes. So, what's special about it? Well, I think to personate is to communicate, give information about the sort of character you are, but to do so with a certain authority. Hobbes himself talks a lot about authorizing, so to speak, the representation of yourself, putting yourself forward as the author, claiming to speak with authority, authorizing yourself, so to speak, in your words, to invite other people to rely on the story, the picture, that you're going to present of yourself. It's to communicate in that way, but it's to communicate in a special way with this authority. Now, what, what could that mean, to communicate with authority the sort of being you are, the sort of persona you realize? <coughs> well, I'm going to introduce a word that's <laughs> quite close to Charles Taylor, but not to Thomas Hobbes, and I'm going to leave them aside maybe from now on, and the word is commitment. It's to communicate, I would say, and at the same time to commit to the content of the communication. It's to communicate the persona you are, but to commit to that representation of who you are, to that communication about who you are. Now, the word commitment sounds very normative, and it is in most of our usage, but I want to use it here in a very non-normative sense. Um, better build from the bottom up, and I want to be, so to speak, at the bottom psychologically in building up this picture of personhood. So, to give an example, an idea of what I mean by, by commitment, think about what game theorists say about commitment. They talk about commitment or pre-commitment, and in the game theory sense of a commitment or a pre-commitment, um, here's how I do it. Uh, let's say I, uh, um, I I, I tell Daniel Weinstock that I will be there at lunch hour tomorrow to meet him in such and such a place, right? Um, yeah, does he believe me or not? You know, he's maybe not so sure, but and I realize this. Now, how do I make my words credible? Well, one way in which I can do it is give a rash 
$50. And I say to uh, Daniel, look, if I don't turn up tomorrow, you can pick up that $50 from Marash. Now he knows that it's an expensive communication on my part when I said I'll be there tomorrow. It's worth, it's $50 worth of communication. It costs me $50 if I fail to turn up, right? So that shows how when you make a communication expensive, you also make it more credible, right? More reliable. Okay, now what I'm going to suggest is that personating in language involves, in a way that comes sort of like second nature to us, involves making our communication about who we are, about ourselves, expensive in that way, and therefore more credible. And it's a permissive communication in the sense of an expensive communication. And that's why you can be taken to speak with authority, because you put your money where your mouth is, as it were. You know, you, you're not just anyone uh, telling a story about what you do. You're speaking with that authority of someone who's invested in this communication. So how does it come like second nature to us that we commit to a self-communication of this kind, a personation? Well, in order to introduce the theme, let me invite you to think with me, first of all, about what the notion of reporting, which is one well-known form of communication, involves. My reporting about, um, for example, um, where there is coffee to be found. And I tell you, I report to you, that if you go out there and you turn left and then right, you'll be able to purchase a cup of coffee. That's a report, okay. Gives you information, if you treat it, if it is truthful, and uh, you're likely to rely on me. But reports of that kind are cheap, and to that extent less credible, in the following respect. If you come back and say, there's no coffee there, right? And I can, there are some excuses I can straight away give you and uh, often be able to vindicate. And one is I can say, gee, God, I'm sure I said, maybe that wasn't the coffee machine I saw or whatever there. I must have, the evidence was misleading, right? And I, can apologize, I can explain my having misled you to you and thereby give you a reason to think that, well, I'm not a... Uh, I, I can be in general believed, I shouldn't be dismissed altogether, maybe there really was an error, I can explain it away. But it, to the extent which I can explain it away by the missing evidence excuse, my report was to that extent less credible. Had I, for example, been able to shut down that excuse, I couldn't invoke that excuse in the case of error, then the original communication would have been so much more expensive, of course, because I wouldn't be able to avoid uh, use that excuse in the case of error, um, and more credible. But there's a second excuse, of course, I might also make in a case like that, which is, um, you know, you go out and you come back and say, there's no coffee machine there. And I say, I've just discovered someone told me things have changed since I made the observation, right? And um, that's a sort of, not so much a misleading evidence as a, the world has changed since I registered things. That's also an excuse with reports that is routinely available, not all of us available, of course it has to be made more credible by collateral evidence, but it's there available in principle. Now those two excuses are associated with reports, the misleading evidence and the changed world excuse. Okay, now, what about communicating about my mind to other people? Communicating what I believe, communicating what I desire, and so on. Well, one way you can do that is by reporting on your attitudes. So, for example, actually in the Oxford you went to, in the Oxford I knew back in the 70s, this was really quite a common, you know, you'd ask someone what they thought about something, you know. I always thought this, but I loved Australia, by contrast, to the truth when I went there. That people all said to you, well, I think what I'm inclined to say is, you know, that sort of reporting on their, what they think, or what they're likely to say, you know, as if they were, yeah, well, I think maybe I do, you know. That's a report. Now, if the person, you hold them, it turns out that what they said they thought they thought, you know, <laughs> it turns out not to be the case, they can say, yeah, well, I said, you know, I wasn't really sure of that. I thought, I'm sure I did believe, I thought I believed that, but I clearly was, was wrong about that. 
you could communicate your beliefs in that indirect fashion. Speaking about yourself like you might speak about the third person, I might say, you know, about, uh, about a rash that, you know, uh, well, I, I thought he believed that Hobbes was, you know, whatever it might be, um, and if it turns out he doesn't believe that, I say, gee, well, you know, I was just misled about a rash. I think when I might say I was misled about myself, I mean, I made the best better thing. You know, we often do that with good reason. Like, you ask someone, are they envious of someone? And they might say, yeah, I don't think I am, really. And actually, it might turn out they are, and you charge them, and by their behavior, and they say, well, you know, I thought, I, would, I guess I am, you know, look at my behavior, but I thought I wasn't envious, I was wrong. Misleading evidence about yourself. Now, that's one respect in which, if you were to report your own attitudes, you could always, so to speak, get off the hook, you know, because after all, nobody else can see the evidence you purportedly relied upon in reporting about your belief. Presumably, you relied upon introspective evidence or maybe a memory of how you behaved when you said you thought you believed such and such. Uh, more, let me give a good example. Someone asks you, is Jones trustworthy? And you say, hey, is Jones trustworthy? And then you say, I, you know, I sort of, yeah, do I, I, yeah, I think I believe that he's trustworthy, you know? And so if it turns out that later you find me acting as if he wasn't trustworthy, and you say, you told me you believed he was trustworthy, I can probably say to you, well, you know, I, I did, that's what I thought I believed. As I said to you at the time, I gave a report to my belief, but actually I was wrong. I mean, you've just seen how I behaved, and I only realized when I wasn't prepared to, you know, rely on him, that actually I didn't hold that belief. Right? So you can report on your own attitudes. But here's the really interesting thing. You could also communicate your own attitudes in a way that is much more expensive because it closes down the misleading evidence excuse. I'm going to use a word, and I think the word is generally used in a sense like this, but I'm going to introduce a technical term, you can not just report, I'm going to stick with belief first of all, you may report a belief, as in Jones is trustworthy, but there's another thing you do, you may avow the belief. And avowing the belief shuts off the possibility, as a matter of shared knowledge with your uh, people you're talking to, shuts off the possibility that you could later explain you're not acting as if you held a belief, by saying, gee, I must have gotten myself wrong. And there's a straightforward way, and this is what I mean by saying it's second nature to us as language users, there's a straightforward standard way in which we evolve beliefs, for example. I'm going to stick with that for the moment. So you ask me, is Jones trustworthy? And I say, is Jones trustworthy? Now, I don't do the indirect, I think I believe that he is. But I say, yeah, Jones is trustworthy. Okay, so what have I done there? I actually haven't answered your question in a way. Your question was, do I believe Jones is trustworthy? Rather than telling you what I believed, and rather than reporting what I believe, I rather express the belief. I would say I evolve the belief by saying, yeah, he's trustworthy. Now, in that case, suppose it turns out later that I'm not behaving as if Jones is trustworthy. You say, hey, you told me Jones was trustworthy, and look, you, you know, I could see you, you backed off, you didn't rely on him. I can't say, gee, I must have gotten myself wrong when I said Jones was trustworthy, because that, of course, doesn't communicate, but in the expressive way, the fact that you believe it, you wouldn't say it unless you believed it. You don't report the belief, but you express the belief or avow the belief, but you can't, in that case, say, gee, I must have gotten myself wrong. You say, what do you mean you got yourself wrong? You did Well, what you can say is this. You didn't stop and look into your mind and scan your mind for introspective evidence and report that just you thought you believed. No, no. You looked at the world. You thought about Jones, thought about the evidence, and you made up your mind that he was trustworthy. And there was no room for, so to speak, you getting yourself wrong. You made up your mind at that point. Maybe you already had a made-up mind, but you reconfirmed the mind you'd made up. Um, and by the way, and I'm not going to talk about that, I think the capacity to make up your mind is equally language-dependent, but that's another story I'm not going to talk about here. But it's because you made up your mind that he was trustworthy when you were asked, that you can't later say, gee, I must have gotten myself wrong. 
You might have gotten yourself wrong had you not made up your mind, but rather scanned your mind and wondered about what was in there, right? So that, if I communicate what I believe about Jones by simply saying Jones is trustworthy, then I, as a matter of sheer knowledge under conventions of language, shut down the possibility of later excusing, not acting, as if I believe that he was trustworthy, by saying, must have gotten myself wrong. So there you are, straight away, is a commissive way in which I can communicate my beliefs, let you know what my beliefs are, in an expensive manner, because I now have shut off this excuse. It's therefore, so I might have responded in either two ways, things like that. I might have said, I think, I think it's, but you can, it's manifest to you that I'm, so to speak, playing safe when I do that. If I say, He's trustworthy, I'm not playing safe, playing cautious. I'm putting, so to speak, my reputation where my mouth is. You can rely on me. I'm speaking, of course, with an assumed authority to speak about myself. I couldn't do that about a stranger. Uh, for example, just say, oh yeah, he believes, and I'm, there's no way you can, well, there is in group agency, but I'm going to put that aside. There's no way in general which you can avow somebody else's belief. Only somebody else can avow their belief. Another way of putting that, you can speak about other people. You can even speak about yourself. That's when you report their beliefs, for example. But when you avow your belief, you speak for yourself. And that's what personation is. It's when you speak for yourself with an assumed authority. Where does the authority derive from? It derives from the fact that you made up your mind. It's a maker's knowledge of what you believe. You thought about the evidence, you made up your mind, and now you have a maker's knowledge of what your belief is. It's not an introspectuous knowledge, it's not a scanner's knowledge, it's not subject to the possibility that you misread the evidence. And so you can speak without, while shutting down that, uh, that excuse, without exposing yourself to the uh, uh, Capacity is the word to get yourself off the hook later. Okay, I'm going to now suggest, and I'm not going to be able to argue in detail, that not only can we speak for, and in that sense, avow our, desire, our beliefs, but we can also avow our desires. I'll speak more about this tomorrow. When I avow a belief, for example, Jones is trustworthy, what I, how can I be so sure about how to make up my mind? Well, presumably on the basis of the data. You know, I've seen him in action, I've seen him in different uh, contexts, and on the basis of that, as I now recollect, I say, yeah, he's a trustworthy guy. Okay, so you ask me now, what, what, do I, what do I desire? And the question is, I might communicate a desire, like, you know, I think I really have no interest in money making, I might say, you know, I think I have little or no interest in, you know, I mean, very rich, I might report like that, and if you see, later you find me, you know, doing anything but so to speak, behaving as if you had that desire, you can certainly say, well, you know, yeah, I guess you're right. I am, I am actually greedy. I thought I wasn't financially avaricious, but I actually am. But of course, you can also avow a desire where you don't allow yourself getting off the hook in that way. Uh, what's the basis you will have, so to speak, for making up your mind that that's something that's attractive to you? Well, in this case, it's not data, as in you make up a belief, you make up your mind about a belief, but it's desiderata. You know, you think about something and you say to someone, um, it may sound like a report, but I'm going to say it's got the uh, credentials of an avowal. You may say it's something like, what really matters to me is friendship, above all. I will not let down a friend, you know, think of Ian Forrester, you know. Um, if I were asked to betray my country or betray a friend, I hope I would, betray, I would have the courage to betray my country. I mean, that's an avowal, indirectly, of this desire, presumably in his part, on the basis of seeing the desiderata, the different aspects of friendship that make it he can be absolutely sure. He makes up his mind. This is what matters to me. And so when he says, friendship is the one thing that matters to me in life, that's an avowal of the desire, not just a report of the desire. And you can trust him 
more than you could if it were merely a report because you know the words are expensive again. He can't or she can't let themselves off the hook later for actually proving not to behave like a friend by saying that, gee, I must have got myself wrong. I really thought friendship mattered to me. No, no, they made up their mind there and then. And so they shut down that excuse. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that we, almost a second nature in language, we speak for ourselves. We speak for our beliefs. We speak for our desires. We speak for our values. We speak for a whole range of attitudes. We speak for ourselves with authority with the authority of someone who makes up their mind and can make up their mind. And that's a really powerful sense of putting forward a persona in those respects that you invite other people to rely on by the very fact that you have made the communication expensive, by the very fact that you've committed to the communication. You're not speaking about yourself as a reporter. You're speaking for yourself as an author, to use Hobbes' word. But apart from the vowing, there's another speech act that we use a lot, which has that same effect of making the communication more expensive, even more expensive than the vowel, by shutting down even more excuses. Now, I said in reporting, and the same goes for reporting on an attitude of mine, there are two standard excuses are always going to be available to me, it seems. I'm pretty well always. One is, oh, I must have got my mind wrong if I report on my mind. The other, of course, is, Oh, I changed my mind. I'd like, for example, you might say, are you going to the football game this evening? And I say, um, I say, yeah, I, yeah I, that, is, that is my intention to go to the foot, football game this evening. Well, if I don't go to the football game, uh, I can always say to you, actually, I changed my mind. Uh, as you can see, I must have got my mind wrong. Actually, you might even avow the intention. You know, you might make clear that this, you make up your mind that on this intention, this is what you have, you're going to go to the football game. Uh, but this evening, you don't turn up, and you say, hey, I had a seat for you, I was waiting for you, you didn't turn up? And you say, I'm really sorry, I mean, that really was my intention, and I wasn't wrong about myself at the time, but I've changed my mind since. But of course, there's a way in which we also shut down that excuse. We shut it down in pledging as I'm going to call it. We pledge our intentions, or equivalently, we pledge our actions. So you say, are you going to be at the football game or not? And I say, look, you can rely on me. I'll be at the football game. Depend on it. Now, that's what we call a pledge. Because under ordinary pragmatic criteria of language use, I can't say if I don't turn up, eh, I change my mind. Yeah, I'll pledge or promise, if you like, all the promises, again, morally, heavily weighted uh, in a way I don't at this stage want it to be, so I prefer the word pledge. We can pledge not our beliefs and not our desires, I should say, but that's a topic I'm not going to address now explicitly. We can certainly, though, pledge our intentions, pledge our actions, inviting others to rely on us to act in that way and making our communication and their reliance more, uh, more credible and their reliance more rational, so to speak, more persuasive, by the fact that I'm going to pay a big cost if I don't turn up. Because I can't invoke the misleading mind excuse, and I can't invoke the changed mind excuse. Probably the only sort of excuse I can offer is what I think was a practical excuse from an epistemic excuse, as in, well, actually, I broke a leg you know, on the way to the game or something. That's why I didn't turn up. That's fine. That lets me off the hook. But to pledge or to promise at least shuts down the two epistemic excuses I've talked about, makes the communication even more credible, because more expensive, uh, than the avowal does. Now you might think, I want to say that personating is involved in avowing your attitudes, and you can avow belief, a desire, and intention, values, etc. And pledging, at least pledging intentions or policies. Because in each case, you're speaking for yourself. You're speaking about yourself in a way only you yourself can speak. Because it's on the basis of being able to make up your mind, as in to go to the game this evening, that you can have the maker's knowledge sufficient to enable you to speak for yourself and to shut down the two possible excuses that would be a let off. Okay, you might think, okay, I'm beginning to get what personation is, but isn't it fairly unusual? I mean, we don't 
We don't speak for ourselves that often. We don't in the vowel way. And we certainly don't make many pledges or promises. It's a fairly occasional thing. So how can it be central to being a person? <clears throat> and at this stage, I want to introduce a theme that I don't think is explicitly in other uh, Taylor or Hobbes, which is that we make virtual pledges, and virtual avowals, all the time. And here's what's involved in that. Suppose um, someone says to me, um, so I take it everyone around here believes that, whatever it might be, um, and you don't demur. You don't say, I, I don't believe it. Uh, you will be taken, as it were, to have avowed the belief. Do you remember that wonderful scene from The Life of Brian? The other people haven't seen this film, I'll bet you anything. This is a necessary film to see for anyone doing philosophy. It's full of wonderful philosophical jokes. But do you remember the scene, the older ones will remember it in any case. John Cleese is the leader of the uh, People's Front of Galilee, I think it's called, or the Galilean People's Front. There are two <laughs> anti Roman sort of organizations. And at one street, he's standing in front of them and he's trying to rouse them, you know, when he says, I mean, what have the Romans done for us? question, think of it if you like, as an assertion, the Romans have done nothing for us, claiming to speak for everybody else. Right? And you remember some say, well, there is the Romans, you know, <laughs> well, apart from the Romans, what have the Romans done for us? There is the hospitals, well, apart from the roads and the hospitals, you know, was that one of the Romans done for us? Now, suppose no one had said anything, uh, it's a matter of common expectation uh, that everyone will hold of everybody else, that they believe whatever has been enunciated in that way. And if someone doesn't later behave as if they believe that, right, then they're going to be subject to complaint. And if they say, oh, well, he got me wrong, you can't say that because I said, well, you should have spoken up. You should have said what about the roads. You know, I just thought the Romans actually did the roads, and that was a good thing. Uh, virtual commitment is where, well, act of commitment, act of avowal, or pledging, is where you say yes to a certain account of what you believe. Yes, Jones is trustworthy. Yes, I'll be at the game. Virtual avowal and pledging, virtual commitment is where it's a matter of knowledge, common knowledge between you and your speakers that they all expect you, for example, to have a certain belief, like Jones is trustworthy. And you don't deny that. And when it's manifest to you and to them, and manifest to you that it's manifest to them, and so on, that they take you to believe this, and you don't demur. You know, you don't disavow the belief. You don't say, that's not what I believe. You don't stick up the finger like the Rhodes guy. Then you'll be taken to have avowed it, right? But similarly with pledging, right? If it's assumed, and you can see some of these building plans around you, be at the football match with them and so on, and you say nothing to dis disavow or undo that, ple that assumed pledge, you'll be taken to a pledge. You won't be able to excuse it by saying, I changed my mind. Come on, you could have told me, you knew that I knew that you were going to be it, and so on. So the thing is, we live in a society of mutual expectation, mutual and manifest expectation of that kind. That's what it is almost to live in active human society. And we are all the time, a whole sort of penumbra of expectation that is manifest to us, that others are holding about us. And insofar as we don't, you know, demur, we don't say nay to those expectations about our, of an involved sort or of a pledging sort, we don't say nay. To that extent, we're committed all the time. So I want to suggest to you that we personate as it were, willy-nilly, just by existing in society, in a network, a matrix of mutual manifest expectation of that kind. It's like a force field, you know, in, that we inhabit. And in virtue of being in that field, we assume a persona in the minds of others, and we are aware of assuming that persona in the minds of others. We shape the persona by our explicit avowals and our explicit pledges, but even if we don't do much active, so to speak, avowing and pledging like that, we still are going to be assumed, and we'll know that we are going to be assumed to have the sort of persona that goes, that passes by, so to speak, virtue of the fact that you don't say no. 
Okay, so I've taken a long time to build up this picture, but I hope it's sort of... Uh, um, I love this picture, I have to confess. <laughs> and I, I'd love to sort of enthuse you around it. It's a picture of deeply social species enmeshed in one another's lives, you know, building up these sort of pictures one another, aware of this picture being built up. And what is it to be a person? It's just to be someone who's, who personates in that way, either actively or by virtue of going along with the persona that's manifestly ascribed to them. Now, if that's what it is to be a person, and of course notice that, and I'm in the country of Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson and, uh, and Zoo Polis, this recent book that you may know, but I love animals, let me say, just in case anyone gets at me afterwards, you know, we have a dog that I'm deeply devoted to. Uh, but <laughs> just animal, no animals I know do anything like that. Even the very social animals do not, in that sense, personate, do not relate in that sort of medium and dimension of language in this way. Okay, so if a person is an agent of this kind that I've described, does that explain the five desiderata? And I want to suggest to you, though, I'm going to go a bit more quickly now because I want to end in uh, 10 minutes for me, and I've spoken about 50 minutes, I think is that okay. Um, the last section, by the way, I have put an angle back, it's because I knew I wouldn't get to that material, but it is connected and you might just be interested. Um, the five characters of capacity based notion of a person. Well, notice if you want to personate, you know, you've got to have a lot of capacities of precisely the kind. You know, they're mentioning those, you've got to be able to reason, you've got to be able to interpret other people, know what they're thinking, use the intentional stance, you've got to be aware of how they're going to interpret you, your actions or your words or whatever. You've got to be able to be a respondent in, in Charles Taylor's sense. You've got to be responsive to others. That just goes with the territory. Okay, so the capacity is fully understandable. What about the duties? Well, the interesting thing is I've described it impersonating. You're shutting down excuses. You're shutting down explanations, so to speak, that would save your reputation. And thereby, you're making your words all the more credible. Well, that in one sense, some of those practices, is making you responsible for, or giving you a duty to perform up to those words. If, so to speak, what you said was one thing, what you did was another, well, you just wouldn't be a person. You wouldn't be a performing person. You'd be maybe a potential person, but that's about it. Or take rights. Well, if you are going to personate, speak for yourself. Speak what you're going to do. That has to be against the background of assumptions about what you may do without, with impunity, what you may do without complaint from others. And that is to say, you have to have a sense of rights to behave and to commit to behaving in a certain realm. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to commit um, at all. But even more important than that, if you've committed to another person to do something, then that person has a right against you under the practice of commitment. And similarly, if they have committed to you in a certain way, you've got a right against them because they shut down excuses in putting forward who they were, who you could rely on them to be, inviting you to rely on their persona. And of course, that gives you a right to complain to them. You know, you didn't act as you portrayed yourself as being. Of course, they may try to cite a different excuse, like the broke my leg excuse, or they may just admit it and apologize and say, you know, I wasn't myself. That's a way of maintaining the relationship. But the point is, there are rights that you gain by virtue of others personating to you, as there are rights you put in the hands of others by virtue of personating to them. And of course, correspondingly, there are duties to live up to the rights that you give other, that other people have given Sorry, to allow other people to live up to the rights that you've given them, and vice versa. Ideal-centered and value-centered aspects. Well, on the ideal, notice, on this, it makes perfect sense, because you could be a self-personator, someone who presents your persona to others, inviting them to rely on, this is who I am. You might be that, but you might not be very good at living up to who you say you are. You might be very good at living up to the persona that you put forward. Uh, and to the extent of what you weren't, you would veer towards the one-time end 
in uh, Frankfurt's sense, you would not be acting on the reasons that you had communicated to others where you were reliably answerable to. So again, the notion of an ideal built into personhood is, is just part of the territory on this conception. And finally, well, just to mention, I'll be talking about values more generally tomorrow, shame, pride, and so on. Obviously, there's room now for feeling pride in being someone who lives up to their word, as we say. Uh, feeling shame in not, in admitting to someone that, yes, I know I went along with being presumed to do such and such as a virtual commitment, and I let you down, and I'm sorry, and, and feel shameful or guilty about it. So all of these fall into place under the image of a person as being a self-personator. But I think this is on the second page, start on the second page of the handout. It also explains why groups can get to be called persons. By the way, I think groups can be persons, group agents. Uh, some of you know a book I wrote a Christian list called Group Agency. I think they can be persons, but I don't for one moment think that the rights of corporate persons are therefore the same as the rights of natural persons. We are natural persons. So I just say that to protect myself against one possible line of objection. But of course, corporate bodies like churches, like political parties, like governments, like countries, like corporations, of course, are persons in the sense that they're spoken for, aren't they? They're spoken for but it may be by, in Hobbes' image, the single person who speaks for everybody else and they rally behind that person, as in his image of the absolute sovereign, monarchical sovereign in the Commonwealth. But equally, it may be spoken for by a voice that is manufactured at many centers and is subject to discipline enough to keep it, so to speak, coherent as a voice. And to the extent to which a corporation, for example, take the commercial case, speaks with one voice, albeit a voice that sometimes is in the so to speak, voice box of the CEO and sometimes of the um, legal representative and sometimes of the financial auditor. Um, insofar as the body is committed to living up to that voice, it's going to be projecting a persona of the corporation, making promises, making commitments, and it can be held to them in law, of course. And um, to that extent, you can see how a corporate body can count as a person too. I'm not going to say much more about that, but it's just to add that there's a sixth desideratum here that also the personation account of personhood will actually satisfy. But what I want to say in conclusion is that the beauty, as it seems to me in this context, of this way of thinking about personhood is that it really supports three strong Taylorian themes about person even though it's based to a good extent on Hobbesian sort of ideas. And those are, as I have them here at the top, it connects personhood with society, with language, and with narration. Now, take the society one. First of all, Chuck has said, a person is a being who can be addressed and who can reply, a respondent. You know, his ideas, it's definitely tied up socially. Now, here's a really interesting thing. And I'm using Hobbesian premises for what is a decidedly un Hobbesian conclusion, I agree. Suppose you think that to be a person is to have this exercise dependent capacity to personate, and personating is inviting other people to rely on your projection and so on. Could you have a person, a solitary person, a person who's the only person in the world? Well, the interesting thing on this account, plausibly, I think, you couldn't. Now, you might think Hobbes himself would have thought you could. You could, after all, can't you personate to yourself, you know, without anybody else around? Promise yourself, I'll do such and such, you know, vow beliefs to yourself, hold yourself to that. And Hobbes is very brief dismissive himself of that idea when he says, no, you can't, you can't make a commitment to yourself because he that can bind can loose, he says. You're not bound, you're not committed if you can lift the bind, the bound, so to speak, that ties you. When you personate to other people, you put yourself in their hands, you invite them to rely on you. There's a real cost you have to pay if you prove not reliable. The cost is at the least reputational. You know, they're not going to do business with you. They're, not, they're going to ostracize you at the limit or whatever. 
the Sadi wonder, short of excuses, that after a, a period of such a failing to live up, they're going to just simply uh, throw you out of society, effectively or literally. And to that extent, they really, you're tied once you give your work to other people. Hobbes' idea, and I think he's right on this, is that it's only by virtue of there being other people to whom we represent ourselves, speak for ourselves, that we can actually be, have the capacity I describe as personation. If you are the only person in the world, you know, and if you can imagine that, the solitary individual, there just would be no, you know, we'd be like, well, in Wittgenstein, I mean, trying to clap with one hand, you know? You need another hand to push back against. You need other people to push back against. Now, of course, we do have a notion of promising ourselves, pledging to ourselves, and vowing to ourselves. But I suspect those concepts of pledging and a vow, they come to us by virtue of the fact we're already in society and haven't got the concept. You can use it of yourself, making a promise to yourself. Although even then, we all know, those of us who try to go on a diet or whatever it might be, we all know that uh, it's a sort of quasi-promise to yourself because, again, there's no real cost except disappointment in yourself, maybe, but there's no cost of the kind there is with another person. If this is right, then persons come in a package deal. You can have persons when you've got a society of persons. You can't have a solitary person. Persons, so to speak, become persons. They learn what it is to personate in one another's company. One thing I should say about this to make uh, to guard against misunderstanding. I think that uh, when I, any one of us personates with other people, there's a strong limit to how far we can, so to speak, deceptively personate, right? You may do, you may be a spy, you may be person in one direction, one place, another direction, another place. But there's a strong limit, I think, psychologically to how far you could split yourself up in that way. And in any case, even if you could split yourself up between two different, so to speak, domains and styles of personation, you've still got to have an image to yourself of what the real persona is. But that image you have of yourself, that sense of your own persona, being true to yourself, has to be of a persona um, that in the first place is constructed in relation to other people. So the very notion of autonomy, you know, of having a self, in Polonius's words that I would have cited in another context had I gone to the last section, this above all to thine own self be true, for then for it follows as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man, you know, has got a certain sort of reality to it. Because there is a persona you have to construct in society. But that becomes equally a persona that matters to you. So that even keeping a deathbed promise becomes really important to you. And you know, that's just, again, covering my back, I suppose, to indicate this is, it's a social notion that presupposes society, but it's got deep personal existential resonance. It doesn't sort of empty out the self. Second theme that's very much in Charles Taylor's, and I quote from him there again, we could not, he says, be inducted into personhood except by being initiated into a language. That follows straight away on the personation account, because it's only in virtue of being able to use language to communicate, in particular use language to communicate about yourself, in particular use language to communicate about yourself in a commissive way, that's in the manner of a vowel, and and, um, and pledging in that expensive way, and equally only virtue, you're doing that virtually all the time, even if actively only some of the time. It's in virtue of all of that, all of it dependent on a communicative medium, language as I'm calling it. It's in virtue of all of that, and only in virtue of all of that, that we can actually personate and become persons. So it's very much a, a language-centered sort of notion of person. I think language is central to human life in a way in which um, we have yet to, at its deepest, really fully appreciate. That's my, my own view. The third theme that I like about this view of person that connects with uh, Chuck Taylor's work is, is the narration one. He says, and I quote again, making sense of one's life as a story is not an optional extract. In other words, to be a person with a self 
you have to have a connection with a story about yourself that you're telling. It's essentially connected with narration. Now, there's one critique, and I'm not sure how far I, I don't think Taylor's work is particularly susceptible to this, but there is one critique of the so-called narrative theory of the self, of the person, that goes as follows, and I'm actually quite sympathetic to this critique. It says, look, this sounds awfully narcissistic, you know? You mean I've got to go around to be a person, I've got to really think about who I am and tell a story about myself and no, that wasn't me, that wasn't me, you know? That sounds like it's a, a narcissistic narrative. You've got to construct a script about yourself. And you must say, no, people aren't like that. It's only just a few eggheads go around doing that sort of thing, you know, constructing a history of themselves and story about That's a critique of standard narrative theory. I don't think it's fair to uh, Taylor. But notice, it's certainly not fair to this story, because there is a narration involved in this story, but it's narration that is a byproduct of something else. It's not narration, story building, sought for its own sake. It's story building that comes as a byproduct, a side product of something else, of personation itself. Because if I am committing to you, I'm presenting a persona, I'm inviting you to rely on it persona rich across, I'm giving myself a character in the 19th century sense, that's rich across, you know, beliefs, desires, values, and so on. And I'm aware of this being projected to others, and I'm aware at any rate of it being whom I take myself to be as one amongst others. <laughs> then every time I make a commitment actively, and every time I acquiesce in a commitment virtually, as in not saying nay to expectations. To that extent, I am building up a narrative about myself, about who I am. But I'm not building it up for its own sake, like a storyteller about myself. Let me tell you about me. You know, it's not like that. It's the, I tell a story about me willy-nilly. I do it without even having to think about it. I do it, actually, without intending to do it for myself, to myself, because I have to be aware of the persona I have in virtue of the commitments I actively make or the commitments I am taken to make and acquiesce in. Okay, so there you have it, the five or six desiderata. I think we know the notion of personation, in terms of the notion of commitment, vow, pledging, realizing this is an expensive and therefore authorized way of self-representation that only we can do for, only for ourselves. And we get the notion of a person then as an agent that does that sort of thing, giving us the five desiderata satisfied and giving us a conception of the person that makes it essentially social, essentially language dependent, and makes persons into agents who inevitably, willy-nilly, are constructing an oration about themselves, though not with any narcissistic self-consciousness. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. is preference ordering, right? So by manipulating the preference ordering of, let's say, the speaker or the receiver, you can, uh, for instance, change the value of credibility. So for instance, we'll say that uh, autocrats may value credibility differently from democratic leaders. And look, we're, we're at the age of the first postmodern uh, American presidency. Things are happening uh, in Britain that, that, that look very strange indeed in terms of personating. And so I wonder whether you think that by changing the context, uh, by, for instance, changing tolerance of performing personhood um, in a way that seems to be happening, right? So there seems to be increasing tolerance of politicians uh, playing to different audiences, of being multiple selves, and, and, and shrugging away, and maybe shrugging it away because we all have become experts at performing our personhood in social media and other settings. And so, how committed, how uh, present, current, context proof is this beautiful view of personhood, um, and, and and are we convinced that um, 
performing personhood in this kind of expert way gets us away from, as you seem to assume, gets us away from person uh, rather than closer to it. So, so certainly in, in terms of capacity, right, it requires greater capacity to perform than to, to be. Um, and so, well, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how far is this a sort of Pollyanna-ish story, you know, about how the world might be, but not at all how it is or it is how it's become? Well, the one thing I would emphasize, in arguing about personhood in this, along these lines, it does make it into an ideal. And I think that it's a, um, um, it, it, it's a work in progress, you know, being a person, for any one of us, you know. You know, it's not like a plateau you suddenly achieve, you know, mature person. We've got to struggle all the time to remain, you know, to amend the persona we're projecting as we change views, but also to remain faithful to it. And it's by no means an implication, I mean, for all this theory says, it's only a theory, uh, most of us might fail that ideal some of the time, and some of us might fail that ideal almost all of the time by virtue of being in Harry Frankfurt's words, a wanton, you know? And I do think that there are wantons on the world stage at the moment, you know, <laughs> whose word you can't, means nothing. I mean, means absolutely zilch. Uh, it's, it's like it's a horror movie, you know, in, in, in my view, you know, it's... So I don't want to say that's not impossible. Do these people, they strut, as you say, and they present themselves as persons, blind me, etc. It seems to me, you know, I think of the phrase, it's, this is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. You know, the virtue is of being a person who can speak, you know, reliably and sincerely for themselves. And um, that people, you know, they say, you can trust me, you know, I'm an honest guy, you know. Um, when clearly they're not, you know, the, the sort of car, second hand car salesman image, you know, gripping you by the elbow, you know, first meeting and calling you Phil. I hate being called Phil, by the way. It's like in a car, so I always call you Phil. And good you are there. You know, we know that's a, that is exactly the tribute that vice is paying to virtue. You know, it's uh, they, people doing that know what it is to be a person who's reliable and to establish a sort of connection and credibility and, and all the rest of it. And the fact that that is what is to be a person at its best does not mean that people always perform up to the best. I'd also say at the beginning, you're not about, you know, preference orderings and manipulation. Of course, nothing I say denies the possibility of manipulation of various kinds. You know, face-to-face -face manipulation, but also manipulation of preferences via very studious means. I mean, we are creatures who have this wonderful, it seems to be, horizontal ideal for each of us as an individual to be a person, you know, who can really live up to their word and form their word on the solid basis of data and desiderata. That's a wonderful aspirational ideal. But it's an horizontal ideal, as I say, a work in progress. And it's the fact that it's there for us is quite consistent with actually when you, as we go to the, um, the foul, ragged bone shop of the heart and, all, or, and, and ordinary existence to cite Yeats, you know, you find something that falls very far short of that, you know. But it's sort of all the more tragic that it does, given the horizontal ide ideal is there. Are untrustworthy people somehow lesser agents? Do they have less agents? Okay, I didn't talk about what it is to be an agent. My sense of what it is to be an agent is just a system that um, reliably pursues certain ends or goals according to more or less reliably formed representations about the circumstances and how best to achieve those goals. So it's a very minimal characterization. Can phrase the question. Are they, lesser, are they lesser persons? In other words, yeah, okay. is, is there... So they're fully agents, is what I wanted to say, picking up your initial statement of it. I do think that to be an untrustworthy person is a little bit like being a, a, uh, a fair-weather friend. You know, a fair-weather friend is not a friend. It's a sort of simulation of friendship. To be a, an untrustworthy person, I mean, widely untrustworthy, is a bit like that. It's like being a fair weather friend. It's really falling short of the ideal that's built into the very notion of, of personhood. So 
because, because Hobbes, for instance, men mentions these people who are like parents. And he says they don't understand the propositional content of what they're saying. So it's, they're just saying words. So he says that it's two different types of persons. I've wondered if the one was lesser of a person, which is a parent, not a full person. Well, I mean, Hobbes, Hobbes didn't think that, um, that the use of ordinary language in everyday discourse was of the kind that people didn't understand what they were saying. I mean, he thought very much that they did. He didn't have an explanation as to where the common meanings get established. The only reference to it is, I think, in De Kive, where he says, language gains common meanings, words gain common meanings, as if by a social contract. It would have to be a prior social contract, interestingly. But I don't think he thinks that ordinary words are uh, such that people don't understand what they're saying, and therefore what they're saying has no value. I think he thinks only when you go philosophical, you know, or scientific, as he would have said. In particular, if you speak in Latin. <laughs> he obviously thought that a lot of people inherited the scholastic vocabulary, you know, substantia, accidents, you know, causa, the lot, that they were just parroting, you know? And he, he was very anxious in theoretical discourse for people to really have a sense of what they meant, which required them to have strict definition, is the phrase he used, and to avoid, for example, metaphor, although he himself didn't avoid it, that was an issue we talked about in the group at lunch hour. Um, but I think that that was just confined, that sort of notion that people speak these empty words they don't understand to theoretical discourse. Victor? Uh, so I, I, I apologize if this is something that, that you intended to, to speak about tomorrow, but I, I, I was really struck um, by what I think is one of the more difficult uh, uh, instances of personhood to attach to a theory, and it's this idea of the value-based pride, shame, love, attachment uh, to group persons. And, and I was wondering what it meant for a group um, to feel that, that sort of thing. Uh, and yeah. one, of, one of the ways is simply to cash it out and say like the goodwill of a corporation in terms of yeah. the cash value of its reputation. Yeah. Another is perhaps the pride that an individual yeah. may feel in working for it. But I think it's neither one of those things for you. I think it's somewhere above or in the middle. Uh, and I, I was hoping you could expand uh, on Okay, so if I can just back off a little. Um, the idea of a group agent and the idea that a group has to have a mind of its own, which I mean in a wholly unmysterious way. And I make sense of in the, here's why I believe that, right? Suppose you've got a group of three people, uh, Daniel, Rash, and me, and we want to form a group that will pursue various purposes reliably and according to similar judgments about the opportunities, the best means, the obstacles, and so on. In other words, we want to perform like an agent, in the sense I just defined an agent, for a system that will reliably pursue certain goods according to reliably formed representations. That means we have to form judgments on which we agree. We won't be a group agent if, for example, uh, we agree in pursuing certain goals, but we each do it according to our own beliefs. That wouldn't make a group agent, it has to be common beliefs. Here's the trouble, here's what these me that groups have minds of their own. Very simple example. Um, suppose we've got to agree on three judgments to guide our pursuit of goals. I, I gave this example last night, and forgive me for using it again, but that would be holy to keep it simple, formulaic. We want to decide our minds on whether P is true, whether Q is true, and whether P and Q is true. Like a court might want to decide in tort whether there was harm done, whether there's a duty of care, that's like P and Q, and whether there's liability, which is just P and Q, right? because there's liability even only if there's both harm and duty of care. So lots of groups have got to make up their minds on propositions connected like that. And all groups have to make up their minds on some propositions that are connected in some such way. Now suppose we're in group of three, and we think, well, we want to create a group agent to pursue these goals, maybe environmental goals, and the judgments are about, you know, whether to concentrate on the campus and cleaning it up, or whether to concentrate on proselytizing for, you know, Greenpeace, or whatever it might be. On P, 
And we decide we want to make up a mind that's responsive to each of us and our own beliefs. And we say, well, let's do it by majority vote. That seems fair. And that's what Hobbes says you should do, and Rousseau says you should do, and Locke says you should do. Well, a rational eye might vote for P, and Daniel votes against. That means P gets up. Great. Majorities vote for P. Comes to Q, a rash might vote against Q. Daniel and I vote for Q. So Q gets up. And now we vote on P and Q. Well, of course, Arash is going to vote against because he said no to Q. And Daniel is going to vote against because he said no to P. I'm going to be the only one who votes that's going to vote for yes to P and Q. So as a group, on that majoritarian way of making up our group mind, we believe the P, we believe the Q, and we believe the not P and Q. You know, it's inconsistent. Now that's, I call that the discursive dilemma, and with Christian and this, we generalize that to an impossibility theorem, that there's no way a set of individuals, and there are a lot of other impossibility theorems now in the literature, actually, in the wake of that, our original argument, our theorem. And there's no way, it turns out, well, no way are a few small qualifications in which you can take the views of, an of the individuals in a group and manufacture bottom-up, you know, subject to ordinary constraints, a group view that's going to be consistent, right? That means that if we were operating as a group, we have to decide, guys, we've got to believe P and Q, or we've got to give up P, or we've got to give up Q. But either way, as a group, if we're going to make our views consistent, we have to be non-responsive to at least one individual, right? Um, which is to say we've got to, in order to achieve collective rationality, we've got to sacrifice individual responsiveness. Okay, that's the source of the idea, but it only suggests that when it comes to judgments, uh, beliefs, as you might count them, and related attitudes, uh, there has to be, a group has to have a mind that is potentially its own, not a system, not a bottom-up reflection of the views of its members. But I do actually think, I really shouldn't have spent all that time on that issue, but I, I, I think it's really a fascinating issue and it opens up all sorts of questions. So I'm, I suppose I'm happy enough I said it, if you don't know about the discursive dilemma or the related things. But I do not think that groups of this kind necessarily have group-level emotions, you know. And when we talk about the shame that the corporation should feel, we're often talking about the shame of individuals in association with that. I think there are very, there's a lot to say here, but let me give one example. Can corporations apologize? Well, when I apologize sincerely, normally I feel sorry about having done what I apologize for. But actually, sometimes I mightn't feel sorry. I might be, you know, just in a, a state of emotional malaise. I don't feel anything. But I realize, you know, I did bad, and I apologize. It would still be sincere if I thought the emotion of sorrow was appropriate, even though I'm not actually feeling it. And I think a corporation can apologize in that sense, you know, recognize that sorrow, if we as a corporation could feel it, and certainly as individuals we can, is appropriate, it can apologize quite sincerely. But it's a complex issue as to exactly what attitudes, and in particular what emotions, if any, can be ascribed to a corporate agent on the basis of at least the arguments that Christian and I and various other people have put forward. Margaret? Um, thank you. I'm wondering if, uh, because your account is language, so language dependent, how we would accommodate experiences for which we don't have language, and I'm thinking of, of hermeneutic injustices, wherein uh, language is, is inadequate or does not exist to express uh, certain experiences. And, and a common example, of course, would be um, the systematic deprivation of indigenous communities' language, um, among other things. And I'm wondering if kind of the inability or the diminished ability to, to speak to one's experiences is irrelevant to your account, or uh, uh, because they're just unable to that's a great issue. Okay, so how far are there ineffable experiences, so to speak, that just can't be brought out in words? Well, to take a trivial case, first of all, um, those of you who know John McDowell's Mind and World will know that you know he, he discussed the following sort of case where 
you see a particular shade, you know? Of color. You don't know a word for this shade of color, you might have a general, word, but it's that shade you love, right? And you, there isn't a word for it. But of course you can, as we are co-opted into language, you know, by referring to that shade, you know, you can use that, uh, as were that example, to exemplify, so it becomes part of your language, so to speak. You recruit it to your language, right? And of course it's true that we, for example, um, well, there's a lovely experiment that's been done with wine. It turns out that, uh, this is Annette Lehrer's work, a psychologist, actually the spouse of Keith Lehrer, who many people will know as a philosopher. Uh, she did work on wine conversation, you know, which she had people talk about wines. They meet in a group every Saturday for a year. And in groups of three in each Saturday, of two, they have three bottles of wine. Each tastes the bottle of wine. They're all white or they're all red. And, uh, and gives a description of the wine in terms of bullish, you know, uh, pretentious, you know, um, soups on of burnt rubber, you know, this sort of language of, of, uh, of wine conversation. And it turns out that after a year, they're still scoring no better than chance at identifying the wines by the descriptions of the other person. So that's a good example, I think, of where language is really not serving us well. It's a trivial example, I know. But there is something ineffable about the exact taste of wine. However, one interesting thing is that when she had experts do this, with the rubbery, burnt rubber language, they did no better than the amateurs. But when she allowed them give a year, vineyard, and gra grape, and um, vintage grape, I think, and, and area, they got over 90% correct, you know? Uh, which indicated that wasn't a descriptive word, that they had a name and they could identify this, but no word for it. So that happens all the time. And no story I'm telling has meant to set of rule, rule, rule that out. But as I say, you know, one of these experts can say to another, I think that is so like, you know, the semillon from such and such a district, such a, yes, exactly right, you know? Um, or you know, think of how we recognize faces. You know, imagine we were all to sit down and write a description of every face in this room, but not mention gender or beards or stuff like that or hair. We probably would have a totally random assortment of description to face, right? Well, we all recognize a face once we've seen it, you know, even though we don't have a word for it. But I can talk about someone looking just like a rash, you know, and co-opting that into language. Okay, I'm making too much of this point, but that's at the... Now, are there ineffable experiences of the, of the mystical, religious sort? I don't know. I would pass you over to Charles Taylor on this topic, because I'm sure there's much more to say. Undergrad, so forgive my limited experience, perhaps, but. With an Irish accent? Uh, no. no, but no. All right, okay. <laughs> um, you reject personhood as something that's derivative of the ability to set an objective in addition to deciding how to accomplish it. But you do mention a few uh, decisive qualities, like the ability to speak for oneself. Yes. Um, is it fair to say that another might be the ability to experience or at least understand the sense of betrayal? Oh, well, I think that's going to go with the territory again. I mean, if we are creatures who personate with one another, co-personate, interpersonate, you know, and build up relations on the basis of this, these personae that we ascribe to another and we self-ascribe, uh, then, of course, if someone lets you down, you know, doesn't live up to their words, particularly if it's someone you've had a long relationship with, or particularly if there are words that have been invested with authority associated with their being a long-lasting friend, especially if it's something which you really rely on them and they let you down, you know, they tell nasty stories about you in, in, in then of course you're going to feel betrayal. So, you know, the emotions, going back to Christine's point, the emotions that are available to us as human beings are much richer I would say, than the emotions available on the basis of nature alone. I mean, obviously, animals feel fear, 
and anger, no doubt, and I no doubt sadness, but whether an animal can feel betrayal, is that an emotion? I think it may be an emotion that comes in superveniently on the existence of this practice and the achievement of personal. Uh, I wanted to push this in the direction of political thought um, because it seemed to me that this, the talk you gave, which was very rich, has a resonance with um, the work that you've done on domination uh, and freedom. Sure. Um, and I wanted to ask about a particular thing and then ask about a troubling, possibly troubling consequence thereof. So it seems like one thing that this notion of personation could give you is a sense of the wrong of domination in a particular way. Because one of the things that domin being subject to dominating power would do is dramatically increase the cost of personation. Right? That is, to speak for oneself, to commit oneself to a particular thing, to make up one's mind, becomes, uh, extreme, uh, becomes much more problematic and, and risky if you're subject to arbitrary power. On the flip side, it dramatically decreases the cost of not personating for the dominant. That is, the, the slave master doesn't have to care whether they've changed their mind in what they say to their slave, right? So, in these cases... there's a lot coming, though. This is yeah, all yeah, very so, <laughs> so, so I, think, I think that's all very interesting um, and potentially very fruitful, but... <laughs> um, I'm troubled by the way then in which um, the figure of the wanton, the figure of the, the sort of bad person, right, um, is also the figure of the slave, right? The, of the? Uh, of the slave, yeah. right? Of the dominated, okay. right? So. So the, the, the very language in which we would talk about someone failing to be the sort of person that we can count on is also the language in which we would diagnose um, um, a, a social system that would make it very costly to personate. Does that make sense? So, so I, I'm, just, I'm wondering about the, the way in which I'm wondering if we can talk about personation um, and being a person without sort of assuming a background of equality these, uh, regarding power, and that that assumption can then be uh, can do some pernicious work if we're not actually being attentive to the empirical circumstances that we're talking about. Okay, so let me be very naughty in a way. Um, if I were to be asked a likely diagnosis of the queer pathology of, of the President of the United States, I would say, look, imagine that you become head of the company, as he did at about age 25, and that you are surrounded by yes-men for most of your life. A yes-man and yes-women, I guess, who would never really oppose you, who, uh, who basically always kept you sweet, where you were in a position. You're almost like the master of slaves, you know? And I thought, he's the, he's the, uh, the, the, the expert in firing and hiring, you know, as we know from, from The Apprentice. Then I think after a certain point, I love your remark about the master, that it becomes so cheap to, per I mean, you don't bother personating, you know? There's no cost to be paid. These guys are, you know, just pushed around. They're like the dog, you know? You just don't care about them. So you don't develop a sense of having a persona that you project and have got to live up to where there cost you have to pay if you don't live up to it. You've got lawyers to deal with the courts and so on if you actually sign up to something that you know that you can always follow that around. I think what you get is some at the end who really is awfully close to a want up, you know, where the words seem to mean nothing whatsoever. I mean even facts don't seem to mean anything anymore. You can even be right about the weather, you know, and have someone chasing for actually correcting you, you know, who is a weather expert. I mean, this is an extraordinary deformation, it seems to me, of, um, of what, what was the person. 
So in order, here's how I hear your question. Think of Hegel and the master and the slave, you know? The master really wants a conversation of equals, you know, and so on. But of course the slave knows perfectly well that he better keep the master sweet. And uh, even if he doesn't serve, if he's not servile and he tries to be brave, how is the master going to know that the slave realizes that the master wants him to be honest? And how the master is still going to think that maybe he's being servile, so they can't trust for him. So I do think absolutely with you that there's, this, there's an oxygen required for personation. There's a sort of social infrastructure, you know, required for, for personation. And it's essentially one in which, and most of us hopefully find it with at least some other people, the most awful of societies, and a group of people uh, among whom you are an equal, and among whom you are uh, respected, and whom you respect, and where there aren't those asymmetries of power that we think of as domination. Because when there are, you just simply, um, uh, you deform the field of operation, so to speak, so that uh, personation becomes on the one hand of the master side, as where who the hell cares, you know? And on the slave side, it becomes impersonation in a way. It becomes essentially not trustworthy. And in that situation, I think both parties are sort of faced with that awful sort of prospect of really not even achieving their individual personhood. This is why, you know, I've often said in the past, and lots of people think, including Chuck Taylor, that you really can't be a free person except in a free society, you know? You can't really be a person at all, I would say, except in a society that has, at least gives you the minimum access to a community of trust and mutual respect where you can achieve that sort of status. I don't know whether that's too rude to you, but I'm, I'm losing the negative tones of the butt. Um, I'll come back to it later. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll be the annoying Quebecois here probably, but like, I will back to you the notion of language. So basically, if we're talking, and I'll try to do kind of the Taylorian theme of multiculturalism with that. So basically, if we're saying that language is the way in which we kind of narrate ourselves, or even we interpret ourselves, or like that part, so being a person is interpreting ourselves within a language. What you talk about the case of the spy, that is different persona, but the real persona is probably deep down inside. I'm really curious about the case of language for that. Because obviously when I talk in English, I have a certain style, I have a certain persona, that is absolutely not the person I have when I talk in French. You're still using your hands as if you're speaking oh, oh, French. Well. <laughs> <laughs> French aspect of it. But there's a kind of aspect of language, and a lot of the problems that come with language, especially like in the Quebec and Canada kind of situation, but we can think here about even more mixed places like New Orleans, where you have Spanish, you have you have Creole, you have French, you have English, and none of them are done like in a way that is kind of coherent for most people outside or for this community it works. I have trouble to see how in such an account of personhood, especially if we bring person to the status of a group, how multiculturalism can even become possible because I have the feeling that there are just barriers between groups that will just act as persona with one another that is never their real persona. And if we reach that point, I have a hard time seeing how an account from language can account for an account of multiculturalism. Good. There's a background here which is worth mentioning, which is Hobbes, of course, does think of language as essential for personhood, and I think for, for reasoning as well, and for a whole range of things. Of course, he thinks it's, a, as he says, language makes men different. It does not make them better, you know, because it also opens up the possibility of positional sort of seeking of advantage and, and really the state of nature, the war of all against all presupposes language. But Though he says all of that, he doesn't have the extra thing that, and Charles Taylor has written a lot about this, that someone like Herder, and I think before him even Rousseau, introduces, which is the notion that, of course, language is social, and there's going to be a different style, so to speak, of thought, as it came to be put, depending on the language you speak. Hobbes never went there, and I'm not sure he would have found it congenial. Uh, even though he did speak many languages and wrote in different languages. Um, now, am I sympathetic with the point you're making about um, you know, multicultural society? Well, notice I did say at the very beginning that I'm not taking language very literally as you know, a particular linguistic system, but a system of communication. 
And I do think that, you know, the Francophone can speak to the Anglophone, you know. There may be, I mean, when I speak French, I used to speak a lot better than I do now. I'm out of practice, but, you know, I was really aware, you know, you, you used your lips differently, you used your hands differently. I loved it, you know, it was, you had in a way a different presentation, you know. Uh, as a thing from the Anglophone, you know, keep your hands to yourself, you know, and don't be too expressive and Italian or something, you know, again, different. I sort of think of those as, I mean, to be embraced and savored and their rich cultural uh, variations on the tapestry of communication and so on, but I don't think of them myself as differences that will sort of break down the possibilities of personation across you know, given there's mutual understanding, as in each speaks the other's language, if not so well, or given there's translation available. So I guess I think um, I'm inclined to resist. Certainly, uh, in the use of person, I often say functional personhood. I am thinking of the adult, able-minded human being as the paradigm of a person. And that's to say that I'm not including animals, and strictly, though I really need rapidly to qualify on this or be misunderstood, strictly speaking, you don't include babies, and you don't include the seriously demented, um, and there are, you know, as we know, gray lines here, which are very difficult to, um, to navigate. I, I prefer to operate with the sharply defined sort of notion of a person because um, it's thick or rich in content, and you can derive a lot of things from it, such as the desiderata that I've talked about. But I am, I, I, I am, as anybody would be, uncomfortable if someone says to me, so you don't think babies are persons, or fetuses are persons, or whatever, or a demented human being is a person? Let alone even before you look at animals. Uh, and I've got to say, not full functioning persons in this sense of personhood. No, they're not. Uh, however, I think first of all that uh, in dealing with either the child or someone you think is not able-minded, there should always be a default assumption that they are a person, that they are able-minded enough or adult enough. Uh, and it should only be as a result of despair that you uh, back off from that. And I think secondly, if you do back off from that, you think, no, this is not a fully functioning person. Uh, you should want those people to enjoy the social or political status and treatment uh, that, as far as possible, given their limitations, approximates what will be due to persons, right? 
in terms of freedom, respect, or whatever you think the relevant values are. Now, when it comes to um, when it comes to animals, um, I want to insist, of course, and I know people like um, Bill Kimlick and Sue Donaldson will sort of sniff at this, but you know their book Zoopolis. I assume it's known well in Canada. Um, They'll sniff it. I mean, I'll say uh, I clearly believe in the importance of animal welfare. I actually think animals should be given rights as well. I think of these rights as passive rights. You know, that there's one sense of right when you've got a right, you can assert the right. You know, that's an active right. Passive right is the sort of right you can give to to something like uh, an animal. You know, who can't assert the right, but you think they should be. So. I don't extend the notion of personhood to animals because I think that, that you're going to have to thin out for it to be a person. And then you'll find you can't make much normative use of it. And, um, and especially when you... Okay, but I think refusing to do that, as I'm refusing, is consistent, however, with thinking there are important normative demands that are to be made in the name of animals, for example, on us, both on us as a polity and on us as individuals. So we still have a number of questions left in the queue, um, but only about four minutes. So I think what I'll do is I'll collect some questions and then uh, leave it up to you to respond to one or two of them. Good. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so please go ahead. Uh, first of all, Professor, thank you for coming to Montreal and sharing these ideas with us. I have what could be considered sort of a knowledge-based or epistemic concern with the notion of personating or personation. You say that uh, sort of the authority for this derives from our own ability to present ourselves and personate, but I wonder about instances where there's a failure to understand what the person is personating to another, either on the subject's end or the other person's end. So if I'm going through a personal crisis where I've had a lot of trouble figuring out you know, how I want to represent myself, what does this say about my ability to personate? But that could just be temporary. There could be longer lasting situations, like an inability to really know how I feel about a serious moral issue, uh, where I'm unable to really present myself and communicate clearly. And then the other end of this is that it seems that there's at least in improbability and perhaps an epistemic impossibility of knowing how another person receives my personation. And if we can't quite know what all of my personation is seen as by others, how much authority can we give to my self-making as a person? Thank you. Well, very briefly, Matthew, I, there, I mean, I do think those sorts of um, problems arise uh, for all of us, some, some of the time, for some of us, much more. Uh, I think, for example, that, uh, I mean, there may be moral challenges and you really don't know what your values are and, you know, moral thought and reflection is required for that. And without that, you won't be able to personate. Personation requires that you've formed your, I'll talk about that tomorrow, that you have a good sense of what your values are. But you may not, that may not come automatically. You know, it may take a lot of thought. At the level of breakdown, you know, where someone really is in deep trouble on these fronts, I think narrative therapy is actually, going back to the narration idea, maybe a very, very useful way of therapy, you know, where you do invite someone to think about their lives, I mean, the therapist does, and to find the pattern with which they want to identify, you know? I think that can be very important. I'm, so I, on that, as well, the subject said, that's what I'm trying to say, on the Others not understanding what you're personating? Yeah, I mean, that's a sort of horror scene, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, there are some literary examples, but, um, you know, where someone feels that they just can't get across. I can't, the examples don't come to mind. I mean, my only comment is happily that doesn't seem to me to be a endemic to the species, so to speak. I think it's rather exceptional. Katerina? Yes, yeah, so, so my question ties back to the earlier question about web personas and about capacities. Um, so it, it, it seems to me your, your account
sounds very similar to Course Guard's account of agency. And to whose? To Course Guard's account of agency. Course Guard, yeah. And she ends up with a problem, right, that she has to say bad agents aren't agents in the full sense. And I was wondering. Animal, animals. Hmm? Animals aren't agents. No, agents. bad agents. Bad people are not agents. Oh, yes, agents. right. Yes, yes, good. I see. Yes, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, good. Yeah, so I was wondering, are bad personas not personas on that account? So what's the metaphysical criteria? Do I need to pledge or do I need to keep my pledges? Well, you know, Sidgwick, I think, had a very good comment about rule, about Kant, when he said that Kant uses autonomy in two senses. One says the sort of autonomy that you have just as a rational human being, and the other is the autonomy in the sense in which you may fail to display it, because it's a challenge, you know, you don't live up to. And the notion of a person, as I'm using it, is that built in, you know, to be a person is to have the capacity, exercise dependent, to personate, right? But that's quite consistent with you're not doing that very well, you know, as in not living up to your word. So I, I, I can certainly live with the idea that, um, um, that there are people who do not personate well. They are persons. I mean, now we, as a matter of convention, as well, they use a person or someone who feels very, very, very badly, so to speak. But at least I'm not going to get into the problem of having a, an ambiguous concept like agent, if, as you described, um, Christian course guards, or autonomy, as Sidney describes Kant's autonomy, which is actually wobbling, you know, between the two. It's a, the idea is it's a concept that is built into it. And of course, it therefore gives you a choice. You could decide, yeah, I just don't even use the word person on someone who fails that badly. Or you might lift the threshold. That's going to be a matter of, of choice consistently with using this concept, a concept that has both a capacity-based thing, capacity to personate, exercise dependent, capacity to personate, but also the ideal built into it. You're going to have that possibility of of uh, okay, that's what I should say. There's one more. So we'll take we'll take one last question and then. Uh, I, think I hate to cut off any. It's been a wonderful yes. set of questions. Thank you. Thank so we'll you. take yeah. uh, one more. Yes. Please. So very briefly, uh, I'd like you to elaborate on the concept of uh, personal integrity, ah, especially given good. The, what you say about personation. Good. Well, just very briefly. I mean, the word integrity. I'm trying to go with. Bernard Williams' usage of it, and you know, he's a classical scholar, and he was clearly thinking of integritas from integer, you know, which means whole, and integrity means, so to speak, being a coherent, basically, uh, system of attitudes as represented, personated, and enacted, so to speak. And um, being a person who lacks integrity might be being a person, you know, who's got beliefs about this, that, and the other, and so on, all over the place. They're not inconsistent, but they're not connected at all. And uh, that'd be one way of lacking integrity. Another would be, of course, to have connected beliefs, as most of us have, a web of belief or value or attitude, but where they're actually incoherent. I mean, that's a, a worse failure of integrity. And built into this notion of personation, of course, is you make commitments to other people. You assume you're an enduring you know, agent over time. You assume that you're not one person in one context and another person in another context, so you're not like a zealot, you know, who sort of mutates between, so to speak, persona. And of course, that's in background, I haven't talked about that. But if you assume persons are to be constant, and that's way across time and context, spaces where, then there is a natural, um, a, 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 a natural ideal built into personhood, which is answers to the notion of integrity. Of course, it's closely related with just living up to your, well, the two, sorry. One ideal, the attitudes you personate have to be pretty coherent and, uh, and consistent with one another, tied up with one another, but also not, not inconsistent. But equally, you have to act on those attitudes. So those are two sorts of ideals built in. But thank you for because you put your finger on something I haven't said, which is there's an element of an ideal about the attitudes you personate and have, and then there's an ideal about enacting the attitudes that you personate. The first is an ideal of integrity. The second is an ideal of, of fidelity or something of that kind. And they are two they're distinct ideals, I see. That's good. Thank you. Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Kelly.